Okay, hello everybody. Um, I want to start my talk. Uh, so we already heard about all the cool Max Quantum tools and I want to talk about the Max Quantum universe. So there's like all these tools in the universe and I think we can just like spend a minute to explore this universe and uh, if you want to travel to a universe of course you need a spaceship and I think it's good to take the Cox Lab rocket for this. So let's start and uh, first we find Andromeda, of course it's, an, it's a universe. We find Max Quant for shotgun proteomics. There's another galaxy, it's Perseus. There's now new stars, newborn stars like Max Quant DIA, Max Quant Top Down. There is Andromeda 2.0 and there is like all the Perseus plugins and many, many more tools. And this universe is circulating, it's circulating around a thing which is called MS data, right? And these MS data, they come out of a mass spec. So first, you have the sample preparation in your lab, then your peptides are electrosprayed into the mass spectrometer, and the output are the raw files, in, case of, uh, in this case it's a thermal device, and then these data, they go to the universe and are analyzed by all these fancy tools. But in this analysis universe, there is like one exception. It's here, there, and this is called Max Quant Live, which is basically not doing analysis of your data, but it's working on the acquisition side. So, this is what I want to talk about and ask some questions. And I want to stay in the universe. And um, as we are scientists, if you have some questions, we look to the stars and uh, try to find the solutions there. So stars tell us, what's the purpose of life, of Max Quant life? So this is not a typo. Um, we're talking about software. Okay, so it's a software tool which allows the implementation of new acquisition strategies for MS-based proteomics. So which are the available acquisition strategies? Um, so there are basically three classes, uh, which is the standard DDA, or I will tell it a top N method, which is precursor selection from survey scans and fragmentation. Um, as MS2 scans. But there is also data independent acquisition, a growing field, where um, like bigger static mass ranges, which don't change, are um, selected for fragmentation, for all iron fragmentation, and then processed with, for example, Max1 DAA in the future. Uh, but there's also targeting tools like uh, PRM, where uh, peptides can be scheduled to be fragmented within certain time windows. So the question is now, are there new strategies possible? Can these strategies somehow be combined? Or can they somehow be improved? And this is uh, the software tool, so this is the graphical user interface. And um, there are some available acquisition, acquisition strategies included at the moment. And um, yeah, I will tell, about, tell you about that. And first, you probably are curious how this works. So let's ask the stars, what are the principles of life? So it's all based on an uh, application programming interface by Thermo Fisher for the QExecutive devices, which um, is a library. Uh, it's also documented in the web and can also be downloaded there. So it's a library. Right, the green one again. Yeah, uh, so this is like dynamic libraries and uh, you can write C-sharp code and program against that interface to control a mass spectrometer. So 
we use these, uh, this, um, this API, which has some so-called events to communicate with the computer. So it, it says, ah, oh, there's a new scan which was acquired. Here's the data. And you can send commands using this API. So that's our math spec, and this is the, the layer of the API. So then the data is coming from the math spec, and then we have like a core uh, part of the app, which is an engine that is crunching the incoming data. And um, then it, there are some scan commands, which are stored in a queue, in a local queue, and then push the sequential CD to the, um, back to the mass spectrometer. And um, this engine uses is a so-called scan protocol library, and these scan protocols are the methods. So all the logic is encoded in the scan protocols. Um, and this is like the basic structure. It's a, it's a decision tree logic. So the scan data, that's the, the green arrow, it's coming in here. And then we have several nodes. They all uh, consist of a filter. So a filter is like basically looking for specific uh, properties of the scan. This can be like just the type or the retention time, but also some isotopic patterns. And then there is a, a template. So this is just like all the settings you can set uh, within the API and some actions. That means data dependent settings. So for example, if an MS1 scan is coming in, then the action would be pick like one or two or 10 precursors from it and set the uh, mass ranges and the collision energies accordingly. So um, the output is uh, one or more scan requests, which are then collected in, in this queue. And all the time, the instrument is free and can, can process a new scan. It's just like um, taking one from, from the queue. So internally, we have a small program to design these, um, these methods. Um, and to try out stuff. But the public version uh, is much easier. So all the strategies which are like or tested and implemented can be, um, can be, uh, can be used uh, with these apps. So there is collection of apps um, which implement these scan protocols on a higher level. And there's these four. And one of them is the top end, which is just a re-implementation for testing. This is not that interesting. But the other ones I will now discuss. Um, but first, I want to show you how they look. They all look uh, similar. So it's like these, these windows. And uh, there's only a few settings. So this is a targeting. We will see that later. And with the boxcar. So it's as few settings as necessary. And they are all collected in an app store. We call it app store. It's not that you can already download new apps in it, but uh, they, they are all in there. And um, it's quite easy to use it. OK. So now let's have a look at, um, at the acquisition strategies. The first one I want to talk about is Boxcar, which was developed by um, Florian Meyer. Actually, he was not using Max Quant Live for the development, uh, but we implemented that, and it made it much easier than uh, for yeah, to to, to uh, apply the Boxcar method. But let's have a look what what's happening there. So this is the LCME, uh, LCMS map uh, of a standard uh, run, like top end method, and we see all these. Peptide features, identified peptide features. The, it's um, a lot of features actually, but um, if you use the the boxcar strategy, you can dramatically increase the number of identified features. Um, so, how does that work? Uh, first, let's have a look how the data is acquired. So we. We have these ions. We have um, like different ions, blue ones and red and uh, green ones. And they are all 
they are then um, filled into, into this uh, iron uh, trap, this iron storage, and then transferred to the, uh, to the orbit trap, uh, which is then analyzing the, their masses. So um, the problem is that the usual filling time or the average filling time is about one millisecond for these ions. And um, the, the run time for, for the orbit trap is like 128 in the case of 60K resolution or even higher. And um, this means like there, is, there, there would be plenty of time to fill the C trap during, uh, during the run time of the, um, of the orbit trap. But uh, this is like directly filled up with ions. And also like, one problem is that uh, I told you we have three kind of ions here, but the, the red ones are not really present here because we have so many high abundant ions which fill up the whole orbit trap and we lose uh, the dynamic range. So the, um, yeah, we, we lose a lot of beam. And the idea of, of boxcar is now to, um, to select mass ranges beforehand, so have small isolation windows for um, regions with high density, with high abundant uh, ions, and bigger windows for regions with uh, smaller abundant ions. And this can then be um, realized using these uh, box cars where you you have these uh, se selection windows um, for for every the cycle, for every orbit trap cycle, and this is then just moving a little bit, and finally you can cover the whole range by having these boxes which are filled up sequentially by the quadrupole. Okay, so uh, you have already seen these uh, maps, but if you now look at the at the ion injection time for, for this run, which is uh, like, um, what was it, 45 minutes. Um, then here, the ion injection time in the full scans of, uh, of this top end cycle was always around 0 0.1. And uh, in the case of Boxcar, this is then boosted by a factor of 10. And also the dynamic range, um, which is here uh, in, in E, is also um, much higher in the case of boxcar. And here also in C, you, you can see the feature count. So there's many, many, many more features uh, detected, as you can already see on, on the map. So um, this is the app in, in the software. As I told you, it's uh, small and easy to handle and there's only a few settings so you have to set the, the number of boxcar scans you want to have um, probably you said something else than zero <laughs> what I have here uh, the number of boxes and you also define the um, the distribution like a, the density of uh, peptides that you get from your run so um, the software can then calculate the box sizes automatically this is um, done by a normed block, a normal distribution. Uh, but the, like there is all, all the settings uh, predefined, so you don't have to change that, but you can, of course, do it. Um, there is another thing which is called Boxcar DIA, uh, which uh, will be available soon. Um, I won't talk about that today, but just keep that in mind. And uh, we will see when, when we have the, the next release, including this. Okay, um, so there's the easy tag. This was developed by mainly by um, Sebastian uh, from, from Felix Meister Group. And uh, this is uh, a, a isobaric cleavable label. So um, something like TMT. Um, so there is a neutral loss group and there is a cleavable side and uh, this amine reactive group which binds to the, to the peptides. So um, if there is 
now, so, and this, like, this is the uh, quantification is based on the MS2 level. So if this uh, precursor I from the MS1 is selected for fragmentation, we get uh, two types of precursor ions, and the fragmentation energy has to be quite low in this case, so that only the cleavable side breaks off and not the whole peptides into parts. And uh, then we, of course, get like still the, the complete ion, but also uh, these remaining fragment ions, so that's the peptides. Uh, with, with the tag but without the neutral loss. So the quantification is not as in DMT, like on the channel of the, uh, of the um, group that's lost, but uh, the, the peptides without the neutral loss group. Okay, so, um, th but there is some problems when you apply a normal top end strategy to that because um, it's so normally the monoisotopic peak is selected for fragmentation, but it can also happen, or it often happens that uh, um, it's uh, the first peak or the second. But let's assume it's, it's a monoisotopic peak, then there is the isolation window, which is usually like 1.4 Thomson, and then um, also part of this first isotopic peak is uh, is in this window and like the whole strategy doesn't work anymore because we have this one isotope which uh, should be used for the quantification but it's like contamination in this case. So the strategy had to be modified the top end and the idea was first to restrict it to the monoisotopic peak, have a smaller window and have a slight shift to the right, right? So where it's safe, <laughs> where it's no isotopic peak around and then you can clearly separate um, the, the different labeled peptides from each other. And yeah, so the easy tag is supposed to be, so there's no ratio compression like you can get in, in TMT, which is a result of, of coisolation and um, Actually, this is like very minor modifications, but uh, it helped us a lot to, to do it because with the software at that time in, in the QExective instrument, it was just not doable. And um, we used Maxman Live for this easy tech. Okay. So now let's go to, to the targeting. So the whole targeting is based on on a technique which we call peptide recognition on, on the MS1 level. So in this sketch we see um, some, some eluting peptides uh, colored uh, over the retention time and uh, we now want to target them. We know some, we have some information. We, we know their mass to charge value, we know that there must be some isotope patterns and also the retention time. And, um, but we also know that this can vary, like the, there are shifts in retention time, in the, in the illusion time of peptides. So what the software does, it's uh, just watching for uh, isotope pattern for every peptide if it appears in in the ex uh, expected time range. Uh, and this is on the MS1 level. And uh, intensity is calculated, and once the intensity is over a certain threshold, which is usually zero in our case, uh, because we also take the isotopic peaks into account, um, then peptide is there. And if we know when it uh, appears, and if you know when they all appear, like then we, we see a, the global shift in elution times can then be calculated, and for the next peptides, these time windows can be set very small, right? Because we already have a prediction when they appear, and also um, we know how, how the distribution looks, so how much they can vary from, from that prediction. So this has, on the MS1 level, a big advantage because there can also be noise in this uh, window, right? And we have like false discoveries, uh, but the smaller these windows are, uh, the, the better the detection works, or the peptide recognition works. 
So um, here we see an LCMS run, and um, on, on this page, uh, on, on chart C, we, we see how the, um, that's the difference of the illusion time from, from our library to, to the run. And there are really strong shifts, and it's going down to minus four, six, six, six minutes. And um, the black line now indicates like the real-time correction. So the expected uh, windows are always shifted, and this is done in real time. Um, and you can also see how the windows, if you, if you look at here, this is now the projection, how the window can be narrowed. And it can, like this is a user setting, so it can be even narrower. On, on the other side, we have uh, a mass error, which is also calculated and corrected, and this is also done for the intensities. OK, any questions? Yes. Uh, I have a question about the boxcar uh, range selection. You said it's based on the normalized intensity of the peptide. I guess that's a triptych peptide. But if I use uh, some other uh, enzyme, that uh, like have a dis different intensity distribution, so does that matter a lot? If it has a different distribution, um, yeah, then then you should use the distribution that you see in your DDA. I mean, probably you do a DDA run before, right? And you have some identifications, or you, I mean, or any DDA run of this kind of sample, and uh, then you can just plot the histogram and try to fit this uh, distribution function, and then just set the two parameters. That in the app, and the rest is done automatically. So, uh, you you think I can add that distribution into uh, into micro, ma, max quant live? Yes. At least in the new version. Okay. So, um, okay, we are speaking about the targeting now and so now, now we, we know this like whole pe peptide recognition and like real-time calibration of retention time and masses so let's have a look at some experiments um, so we did uh, something which uh, we call like global targeting which is kind of doing targeting but on a large scale so we, we try to fragment as many or identify as many peptides as um, as is possible with DDA, but in a targeted manner. And we uh, run HeLa over 120 minutes and targeted uh, 30,000 peptides and um, had a like, very high reproducibility. So on, on this chart, you can see the comparison. So this is tri uh, triplic. Triplicates, so we had three runs with uh, DDA and the percentage of peptides that were present in all three or fragmented in all three runs was around uh, 60% and uh, doing the, the targeting approach, the global targeting approach, we could increase that to up to 90%. So the reducibility can be uh, drastically improved by, by doing this uh, targeting global targeting. And here, like the peptides are fragmented as soon as they are detected on, on the MS-111. Um, but there's also another way of targeting. So as I told you, uh, we, we have this correction, right? And um, this gives, uh, gives us a prediction of the illusion time and of the illusion, the, the watch window that uh, it should be used. So what if uh, we, we take this information to target peptides which are very low abundant, which are not visible on the MS1 level? And uh, for this, we use the HeLa mix uh, of uh, heavy and light. And the high abundant peptides we um, use as so-called correction peptides. 
So we, we had a long list of peptides which are only used to calculate this, um, the, the retention, the illusion time shifts and the illusion time windows, uh, but they're not fragmented, so they're like just landmarks. And then we had a selection of uh, heavy to light pairs where the, uh, the, the I don't know what's the light, I think the, the heavy part was very low abundant and um, could not be seen, could not be uh, identified on the, um, in, in the normal full, full scan. And um, we, we then applied like so-called SIM scans so that we really selected the master charge ranges where these peptides appear and like, oh, during the whole uh, expected illusion time, these uh, SIM scans were, were repeated and um, this was like then digging out these uh, very low abundant peptides out of the noise. Okay, so in a more general way, which are the possible scan modes? So we have two types. So there is uh, either there's a time span where the peptide is present, it's visible on the MS1 level, but there's also this watch window. And uh, this is, uh, ah. this is as, I, as I told you, this is dynamically uh, adjusted uh, over the, over the runtime in real time. So this means um, we can not only do uh, MS2 scans or uh, SIM scans uh, when the peptide is present, when we have a signal, but also do over the whole watch time, over the whole window. Uh, this can be fragmented over and over again, or uh, SIM scans can be performed over and over again, because this is like somewhere in, in the noise. Okay, and um, the new version, 1.1 beta, which could be online, but uh, unfortunately our web server didn't work today, so it's not yet uploaded. Um, the, this correction can also be based on uh, fragment ion detection. So we don't rely anymore on, the, uh, on this little bit noisy uh, MS1 detection, but also um, peptide ions can be predefined, and if they are detected, this can be taken as, uh, as, as correction. So in this case, you will need less correction peptides uh, as on the MS1 level because you're more confident because you have an MS2 uh, identification. It's also do, um, possible to do a targeting in boxcar scans. So if you do the MS1-based detection, it's probably pretty good if you have this uh, high dynamic range to detect even low abundant peptides. And uh, it's also possible to exclude peptides. If we know like the certain peptide will appear uh, within this watch uh, window, we can also say, okay, we don't want, we, we want to have a, like a top end method, but without the peptides that we already know, we exclude them from the time range. This is also possible. This can all be configured uh, in, in this targeting app. So uh, this is how you expect uh, targeting app to look. So we have a list of uh, peptides which can contain target or correction peptides. And on the left there is all, all the settings for the acquisition strategy. OK. Um, the software is pretty easy. Uh, it's very clean. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, the graphic user interface has like three, three, um, three tabs actually. Um, it's the instrument settings, you have a base application, and then you have this scan protocol library, which contains all the scan protocols. So the, for the instrument setup, um, it's only the QExecutive series um, supported at the moment. Um, uh, so you should select the instrument that you want, which is only this one, um, and click connect, and then it's connected. Um, but it's really the whole series. So it 
I mean, we test it with the uh, HFX, but it's also working with the HF. Um, it's even working with the QE Plus or the QE Classic. If you do that, you have to be careful because the settings that the software accepts is not like that. It's not guaranteed that the instrument accepts them, like settings like mass ranges, collision energies, whatever. So, but you can do it. So you just have to know what you do. Okay, um, there is a, a scan protocol library. So we have a list of scan protocols. This can be, you can um, hold up to 5,000 scan protocols, but you can have several of them for every user. And uh, if you want to create new scan protocols, then there is this app store, as I already mentioned. We also managed to seamlessly integrate MaxQuant Live into the usual workflow. So if you have like this list in Excalibur of, uh, of runs and you want to have standard methods, standard uh, thermal methods run, but also some MaxQuant Live runs in between, this is not a problem. You can just keep all, all the workflow you have, so you only have to um, uh, open Max One Live and attach it to the instrument, and then do some special settings uh, in your method where you encode the number. In this case, is six thousand. So it's the, the scan range encodes the the ID number of um, of the scan protocol in this list. So this is the trick, I would say, but it works pretty well. And ah yeah, okay, and you can also encode the runtime. Oh you also actually you have to include the runtime, like in this kind of cryptic manner, but um, it's quite easy to do. Um, there is some documentation. There is a website of www.maxquant.live um, where you can download the software and which also links you to, to, uh, to the documentation page, which is uh, with the docs page, or there also is a Google group, small Google group, but um, I think it's pretty, pretty helpful. And of course, there is uh, this paper which was, was published this year in uh, MCP. Uh, I want to thank some people. Um, so of course uh, my group, uh, but also the people from 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 the Man Lab, uh, Florian Meyer and Sebastian, and also Andreas, uh, which were like testing all the methods and had had a lot of ideas, and also the people from Thermo Fisher, which supported us with the API. Okay, so if you're ready to go live, um, come to the boot camp tonight, um, which will be held in, in this room, and I will show you how to, yeah, how to run it, like how, how to set up the software, how to start the software. We will have a remote session to a mass spec in, in the Kuhn lab, and yeah, I'm happy if you come. And thank you for your attention.